What I'm going to talk about this morning is, is the social media Doppler effect. And um, it's a fairly technical audience, so I think most of you are familiar with it, but I'll give you a refresher just in case. Uh, the Doppler effect is if somebody is standing still and um, let's say a train is approaching you and the noise that the train makes makes a higher pitch sound when it's approaching you and a lower pitch sound when it's moving away from you. So if social media made a noise, then for most organizations and frankly most, most individuals, the sound that it makes would sound like it's moving away from you. Um, so let's, let's take a look at what I mean by that. Um, I've been doing these things for several years now, specifically in the industrial marketing space called inbound marketing evaluations. And what I do is I, I take a look at the web presence for some of the, the big industrial vendors and um, grade their presence against 26 different criteria. I'll just give you a really quick overview of what I mean by inbound marketing. Um, it's the opposite of outbound. So. Since the introduction of mass media for about the last couple of hundred years, most businesses have been involved in outbound marketing, which are things like advertising, direct mail, cold calling, even email is a, is a form of outbound marketing. And um, the, tr the problem with that is that uh, the internet, social media, and other disruptive technologies are making that less and less effective all the time. And so what they're turning to is something called inbound marketing, which is the opposite approach. And, and it's taking a mindset that says, well, what if instead of trying to interrupt people with messages that they didn't ask to hear in the first place, what if we put content out there that people are interested in and makes them want to come and listen to us? So that's what inbound marketing is all about. And as I said, I've been doing these evaluations for several years now. And, and I just finished another one in December. And I looked at it and I said, um, the grades have been falling steadily over the last three years, even though all of these, or most of these companies are doing more and more with inbound marketing in general, but especially in social media. So, you know, I, I um, had to ask myself, why is this happening? So as it turns out that, um, at least in this case, slow and steady is not winning the race. And I think as we all know, in, in most big corporations, slow and steady is pretty much the MO under which they operate. Um, my first reaction as I saw the grades going down is that, well, I must just be getting cynical or, you know, my, my grading must be tougher. But um, it wasn't about companies that weren't getting it. I, I, as I thought about it more, it became clear to me that the reality is that uh, they're just simply not moving fast enough. Uh, the size, shape, and content of the internet in general is, uh, is changing, and it's, it's changing at a faster rate all the time. And this trend is accelerating. The, the, the change is not at a constant rate. It, it's accelerating. So um, how does an organization get in front of the train rather than behind it? Well, um, hockey great Wayne Gretzky was asked um, how he became such a prolific scorer. And this is a fairly famous quote where he said that, I skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it's been. And it's something that sounds simple and obvious, but it takes you know, quite a bit of skill and, and dedication to actually be able to do that. So um, that's what we're going to do today is, is take a look at um, why this is happening. I'm going to give you uh, what I think is an excellent case study that shows you that it is possible to get in front of this train to catch up and even, and, and even get in front of it. So let's talk about how innovation is accelerating. Now, I'm a computer geek. My parents bought me a Commodore 64 at the age of 12, and my idea of having fun was teaching myself how to program in C. Um, I've spent the last 30 years on the bleeding edge of technology. I have the scars to show for it. Uh, when I was in high school, I was a computer operator for a local company. That was back in the days where the only computer at the company was in one of those windowless, uh, dark rooms. And uh, then when I was in college, uh, I had a job doing CAD drawing, so I was the guy that used the IBM PC at the company 
to make those those CAD drawings. And then my first job out of college, again, I was one of the I was a, a plant engineer, an automation engineer. I was one of the two or three people in the whole company that had a PC in order to, to do their job, which made me public entity number one for the IT director, but that's a whole other story. Um, and then in the late 90s, I was developing websites using a text editor, and I knew who Mark Cuban was before he owned a basketball team or was swimming with sharks. So I'm not telling you all of this stuff about myself to brag, but to explain to you or impress upon you the fact that I'm somebody who's never been, uh, that is very comfortable with innovation and with new technology and with change. So, you know, when I tell you that I am finding it a challenge to keep up with the pace of change these days, I, I hope it gives you pause. Um, just think for a moment about how business was conducted in the 80s and 90s. How often did a real game-changing technology come around? that forced companies to tear up their strategic marketing plans and, and start over, or, or even their operational plans. You know, you had um, fax machines that were a disruptive technology. You had personal computers. You had mobile phones, the internet. These things happened every couple of years back in the 80s and the 90s, but now, thanks to Moore's Law and social media, um, they're happening every couple of months. And let's take a look at some of the reasons why I think this is, that this innovation is, is accelerating, getting faster and faster. And the, the first thing that I think is contributing to it is the user growth of these various social media channels. So if we, if we look up here, what we're seeing is how long it took these different channels to get to 800 million users. So you can see how quickly Google Plus was able to get to 800 million users as compared to any of these other ones like Facebook or LinkedIn or um, that's MySpace if you don't get what that icon is. And Google was very proud of this and, and said, you know, look how great we are, how quick we grew our Google Plus community, 800 million users. Well, as far as I'm concerned, they stood on the shoulders of giants uh, to get there. And when I say fast growth begets faster growth, what I'm saying is that new social media channels are able to establish themselves faster these days because of existing social media channels. So Google Plus was able to get to where it is that quickly because of Facebook and Twitter. People, as Twitter especially, is where people found out about Google Plus. Um, but for the purposes of our discussion, it doesn't really matter why this acceleration is happening. We just need to recognize that it is. And so what it means is that the next big thing is never down the road these days. It's right around the corner. The second phenomenon that I think is, is fueling this accelerated innovation is the mobile influence. And so here's the obligatory slide that shows you the ridiculous uh, adoption rate of all of these uh, mobile technologies, in particular smartphones. Um, but this isn't the graph that is really particularly interesting to me. I'm sure you've all seen these graphs before and the projections that everybody has of, of the, the penetration of these devices into the market. Um, this alone isn't enough to contribute to the acceleration. For my money, this is the more interesting graph. And what you're looking at here is, uh, over a period of a couple of years, the, amount of the number of minutes per day people are spending browsing the web. So the blue line is what is the amount of time they're using browsers to browse the web. And the other line, is the amount of time they're spending browsing the web on their mobile devices. So what's interesting here is that the time spent in browsers is essentially flat, whereas the time spent on the mobile devices is increasing. So what that means is that mobile is not replacing desktop. It's adding to it. So if you dig a little bit deeper into the surveys, the industry surveys that have been done, to find out how people are using these devices, what you're finding is that what mobile is doing is not only increasing 
how much we're using the web and social media, it's changing it. In other words, we're using it differently than we do with our desktop. Um, we're checking Facebook while we're standing around in waiting rooms. We're talking smack during football games. We are making predictions about plot twists while we're watching The Walking Dead. How many people have heard of the second screen phenomenon? Yeah, so what, what they're talking about there is, is that uh, people now, while they're watching television shows, and especially live events, Grammys or whatnot, people are talking about what they're, what they're watching on TV. And I apologize in advance for the, for the visual, but um, one of the top three, in all of these surveys that they do, they find out that one of the top three most frequent places people are using their mobile devices is in the bathroom for whatever that's worth. So the point of all this is, again, that, um, oh, one thing, one note I jotted down was I wanted to make a point. Roy talked about in his presentation about how one of the complaints is that, you know, I don't have time to use social media. Well, to me, what this chart shows is the time is there if you're using your, your smartphone because we're just, we're finding, like I said, different different places where we can fill in gaps of, of time uh, to, uh, to dive into social media. So to wrap up this part of the presentation about this changing pace of innovation, what I wanted to do was show a couple of graphs that actually provide some visual evidence of this acceleration. So what we're looking at here are the number of major Google algorithm updates per year. Uh, going back to 2006, and as you can see, that's not linear. That's geometric. So, as a practical matter, what it means is that um, at least half of the search engine optimization techniques that a company has been using or was using three years ago, you can just rip them up and throw them out because they don't work anymore. And if you were and and if you were reviewing your marketing strategy once a year, um, that's not enough anymore. You have to tear it up once a year and start over, and you've got to review it at least quarterly, if not monthly, because things are changing that quickly. And then finally, this, uh, this chart is, is courtesy of Avalanche Media, and what it shows is the history of marketing channels going back to 1839, and this is not the... Uh, the x-axis there is not to scale. Um, if you look at the right-hand side of that chart where all those lines are, that half of the chart represents the last 40 years, where the left half of the chart represents uh, another 140 or so, 130 previous years. So again, what this is showing is the rapid pace where brand new, completely new marketing channels are opening up. Again, the pace of, of innovation is accelerating. So, so now what? Um, raise your hand if you're a marketing manager or executive who is going to have nightmares of shrinking market share and feelings of social media inadequacy. Um, if you feel that way, I don't blame you. Uh, it can be intimidating looking at this. And it's easy for somebody like me to stand up here and show you all these charts and say you're doing it wrong and you're not doing it fast enough. The hard part is to say, all right, how do we change that? How do we, get, how do we skate to where the puck is? Um, well, I actually have a case study. I think last year somebody figured this out, and they did a pretty good job at it. And I'm going to break one of the rules of, uh, of public speaking, which is um, thou shalt never talk politics um, when you're doing a presentation. And the Obama for America campaign last year, um, there have been a couple of reports. So a lot of what I'm going to show you in this section came from this, uh, this, this report. The URL is up there if you're interested, Engage, from Engage DC. It's called Inside the Cave. And I read this report, and I just said, wow. They did absolutely everything right. And so I'm going to go through some of this and, and show you some of the examples of, of how they figured all this out. And they got in front of the train. They skated to where the puck is. They were in front of uh, the, the social media Doppler effect. And um, 
because I think it adds credence to the argument, I'm going to admit to you um, I didn't vote for him. Okay, so this is I'm not a fan. And what I would encourage you to do is to look past any political bias you might have in either direction. So if this is somebody that aligns with you politically, um, you know, you might take offense at some of the manipulative tactics that I'm going to talk about. Or maybe if you're from the other side of the political aisle, you'll underestimate the courage and business acumen that it took to pull this off. But if you can take a look at what I'm going to present objectively, I think you're going to find a lot of really valuable information that can be applied to your company or even your personal, your, your professional career. So I'm going to start with the results. What were the results of this approach that Obama for America or OFA did? Well, the first thing they did differently was their laser focus on results. Results were the only thing that mattered to them. And what I present here is Exhibit A for the prosecution. One of the things they did very differently from traditional um, political campaigns was that they used computer models instead of computer polling. So polling was a pretty hot topic uh, and specifically how inaccurate a lot of the polls were this year. Well, the numbers you're looking at here were at the top, that was the uh, predicted vote count for the Obama campaign based on their computer models. Um, and this was in Hamilton County, Ohio. And you can see it was within a half a percentage point of what the actual vote turned out to be. And as it turns out, they were incredibly accurate in all five swing states. And as far as I'm concerned, I believe after reading through this report, this was the reason that, the, that they won the election, was because of this, this computer modeling and the system they had in place and knowing where they had, they had to put their resources. Um, so to bring it back to your company, I ask you, who's determining your marketing strategy in your organization? Is it driven by polling or is it driven by modeling? Or worse yet, is it driven by gut feel? Um, when you want to talk about results, I don't think it gets any more bottom line than, than revenue. So here are some numbers for you to chew on. Um, Obama for America, using these digital marketing best practices, were able to raise their bottom line uh, in every way conceivable. First of all, they were able to recruit more donors they were able to increase the average donation amount per donor, which obviously also raised the bottom line. So how would an 11% increase in customers look for your company in one year? Or what about a 24% increase in the average purchase size of those customers? Or how does a 38% revenue increase sound to you? That's what they were basically able to do, is a 38% year-over-year revenue increase in their campaign. One of the other differences, one of the other things that they did really well was um, make their system disaster-proof. So um, when, we, when you talk about building any system, robustness is important, especially in the situation that I'm talking about with this social media Doppler effect and the acceleration of innovation and change. You've got to be nimble. You've got to be able to adapt really quickly. Um, so the Obama campaign held something called game days where they would actually simulate disasters. I mean data disasters, like data centers going down, um, things of that nature. It When you talk about disaster recovery, it's not enough just to write up a plan in a manual. You have to actually practice it and, and make sure people know how to use it. Now, the stakes for a, an operational system, or a SCADA system for that matter, are much higher than they are for a marketing system. But when you, when you think of it in terms of marketing, there are plenty of man-made marketing disasters too. And they can prove just as costly, so you have to be prepared, prepared for those as well. So those are the results that they were able to generate. What were the strategies that they employed that allowed them
to realize those results? Well, the first one was that they only trusted data. Um, I've actually been involved in a couple of political campaigns from the inside, and, and, and what I can tell you is that um, neither of the ones that I worked on were data, very data focused at all in terms of setting strategy. And um, as we'll see as we go through the rest of this presentation, they use data to dictate things like email subject lines, television commercials, which markets they uh, pursue, and even the words that they would use in speeches. Um, and once, as that quote illustrates, once they started looking at the data, they found that a, a lot of the stuff their gut was telling them was wrong. This is the guy that they hired to run this system. Uh, his name is Harper Reed, and he has extensive startup experience. Uh, he's one of these Silicon Valley types. And um, that's sort of one of the things that I look at as an outsider that, that I thought was courageous that they did in the campaign was they basically, um, as you can see in that quote there, they kept the strategists and the speech writers separate from the IT and the digital marketing people and allowed them to focus on, again, results. We need to get results. The final strategy decision that, that stood out to me was their commitment to testing everything. Um, it's one thing to use analytics to measure how well you're doing, but testing is something altogether different. Testing is a deliberate system that you create to say, we are going to create different scenarios and we're going to test which one's going to be more effective. And one, there's one startling example of this that I, th I believe turned the entire election around. Back in June of 2012, um, the Obama campaign wasn't doing very well. They were being outraised and outspent by a pretty wide margin. So they didn't put together an email to appeal to their base for donations, they put together 12 emails and they sent them out to various test groups and they measured the response rates on those. And then they took the email that performed best and that's the one they sent out en masse to the entire support base. And then what they found was, after the fact, that email raised $2.6 million, one email. Now, what they did was they looked at the results from their testing that they had done, and they said, if we had sent out the worst performing email, it would have generated $400,000 in donations. So just by doing that one test email that they sent out, they basically improved by $2.2 million. That was the difference between the best performing email and the worst performing email. And by the way, the median email was only $700,000. So there was still a huge gap between the median and the best. So um, based on the slide that I have up right now, can anybody guess over the entire Obama campaign, what was the most effective email subject line that they used. Hey. So how many, how many businesses would have the, the gumption or the courage to start a marketing email that just had that as the subject line? Probably nobody, but if the data told you that that's what worked, why not? So one of the uh, one of the sayings that I use quite frequently comes from Sun Tzu's Art of War, and it was actually one of the things I did in, in last year's presentation here at the forum, is that um, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. So you can have a great strategy, but if you don't execute that strategy, you're not going to get the results. So what I wanted to do is cover uh, a few of the specific tactics that were used in, in the campaign that allowed them to get these results. One of them is, um, their use of this system called DevOps. 
And I'll just read you the Wikipedia definition real quickly. DevOps is a software development method that stresses communication, collaboration, and integration between software developers and information technology professionals. DevOps is a response to the interdependence of software development and IT operations. It aims to help an organization rapidly produce software products and services. Now, the reason I bring this up, again, is because the whole point of my presentation here is the Doppler effect and this acceleration in the pace of innovation. And what I'm trying to say here is um, none of you are doing this fast enough. You've got to go faster. You've got to get in front of this train. And in order to do that, you know, in um, there are a lot of large companies in the organization here. You've got uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of products. You've got divisions. You've got multi-layered uh, organizational bureaucracies. So you need systems that are going to allow you to rapidly develop, not software applications, but rapidly develop marketing strategies and be able to change them on the fly as these technologies change and develop. One of the other tactics that were used were a heavy reliance on social analytics. So um, just one example that, that they talked about was trying to reach the crucial 18 to 29 year old demographic. One thing they realized was that, again, traditional campaigns relied heavily on uh, calling landlines. And they realized that people in this age group, 50% of them didn't have a landline and weren't reachable that way. Um, but 85% of them were friends with the Facebook app that they had released. So they did something they called targeted sharing where they, they went out and they, uh, for all of their fans, they went and they identified six of their friends. They took the picture and the name of those friends, put it in an email, and sent it out to these people and said, hey, can you reach out to Joe and Fred and Sally and Jim and, and so forth and ask them to do blank? And sometimes that was make a donation, sometimes it was register to vote. And what they were able to do was they sent those emails out to 600,000 people and they ended up reaching 5 million. And of those 5 million, 20% took that action. So whether it was a donation or registering to vote. So those 600,000 people resulted in a million conversions. Um, one of the other tactics that they used very successfully were communication analytics. And they did this in, in two ways. The first way they did it was um, they built a tool that took local newspaper articles and they analyzed it by geographic region and they actually looked at the comments below the articles and they figured out which parts were quoted the most and what people's reactions were to them. And they analyzed all this data and they fed it back to the speech writing team and the speech writers would use that data to figure out what they were gonna use in future speeches. So think of that in terms of figuring out you know, what should be going in your product brochures. Um, the second way they used these communication analytics were to figure out what television channels would be most effective. So they used their, the social graphs of their Facebook fans to find out what television shows they watched and what networks they watched and when they watched these shows. And what they were able to do was build a very detailed map of when would be the most effective advertising slots for them to put on their commercials. So the end result was that their ads were appearing in 60 micro audiences while at the same time Romney's ads were appearing for 18 macro audiences at the same time for the same amount of money. So a 60 to 18 ratio in terms of the audience that they were able to reach. Much, much higher efficiency. Um, another tactic that they used very successfully um, 
were, was landing page optimization. So when I look at the websites of a lot of the major vendors in this space, in any space to be honest with you, um, not just to pick on industrial automation, uh, this is just a, a weakness in general, um, landing page optimization is, is either non-existent or, or very, very poor. So I'll just give you an example here. This is a, a before and after shot of the donation page for the campaign. They conducted 240 A-B tests on their donation page. And that resulted in a 49% increase in conversion rates. 49%. Um, some of the specific lessons they learned were, again, counterintuitive, but ugly stuff worked. So this was in a lot of the emails that they sent and in some of the landing pages. Um, big, yellow, ugly, highlighted sections actually resulted in, in higher conversion rates. Um, they found out that they needed a completely separate strategy for mobile. They needed something that was a single click. And one of the most important lessons they learned was that um, on the left, you'll see the original donation page they had was one long step. When they broke that into four short steps, that also showed them a rather large improvement. So what's next? Given all these lessons learned from a political campaign, how can we apply that either to your company's marketing or even to your own marketing? How do you market your own professional career? Um, so I came up with Three things that I think you can look at that if you can figure out a way to work this into your strategy, it'll allow you to skate to where the puck is going to be. Um, the first area has to do with social targeting. So a lot of the examples that I just showed from the campaign um, used some of these, these, um, these strategies. But the first thing that you can do with social targeting is look at demographics. So. Um, you know, look at age, sex, profession, geography, language. Um, if, you've, if your social media audience for your business or even for you professionally is large enough, you can take a look at these demographics. And, um, you know, spreading your advertising budget these days, uh, just smearing it across a few major channels um, is, not, is no longer going to allow you to be as efficient as you can be. But social targeting, especially relying on these demographics, will. Uh, you know, you can, um, you can use this to craft and target narrowly focused message. Think of it as being able to fine tune your message to these demographics. Uh, another area that can be really effective, and again, this applies both uh, to a company that's marketing its products and it applies really, really well to your own personal career development. And that is using social targeting to figure out influence. So there are a lot of tools. Roy showed you an example of one of them um, to, that can show you how you intersect with your social audience. There are other tools like Follower Wonk where you can analyze a social media audience for a particular topic or hashtag or, or what have you, and you can identify influencers, and then you can engage those influencers to um, make them aware of you, to help them carry your message. Think of it as a megaphone or, or an amplification of your message to target those influencers and get them to help you carry your message. And then finally, there's um, mining social data to identify both old and new media preferences of your audience. So, as I was talking about earlier, the way that the campaign used their social demographics of their fans to find out what television shows they were watching, use these social targeting tools to find out what magazines, what, what trade magazines are, are people reading, uh, what LinkedIn groups do they belong to. The end goal is to get much, much more efficient with your efforts so that you can identify, much like the micro audiences that the campaign was able to identify, figure out where are the right places for you to be spending your time. Again, whether it's a company that's marketing products or you as a professional marketing yourself, figure out 
where are the most efficient places to be in investing the precious time that you have? Um, modeling and analytics. A major implication of this Doppler effect, as I've been saying, is, is the pace at which the, your strategies and tactics are, are going to have to adapt and evolve. And it means there will be a need for more advanced audience modeling and, and analytics to understand the movement habits. So remember, we talked earlier about how quickly these adoption rates are happening now when a new social media channel pops up. So what that means is that uh, a, social media, a social media audience is a migratory beast. They move around. So if you develop a marketing strategy or a personal you know, uh, career development strategy and you say, OK, um, I'm going to use Twitter, and you set up your strategies and your accounts based on assumption that there's a certain demographic set that is using that social media channel in a certain way, it's not static. It's fluid. That's going to change. So what I'm getting at here is you have to have sensors. Think of it like a, a seismometer or a, a sen any sensor you'd have in a, in a SCADA system. You've got to be out there listening to what's going on and detecting changes in these social media audiences so that you can adapt your strategies and, and tactics along the way. And finally, the last bit of advice that, that I'll give is um, something that I call digital singularity. Um, what this means is eliminating silos. When you look at a lot of um, digital strategies or, or marketing strategies right now, uh, we tend to look at things in terms of mobile versus desktop or print versus digital or website versus social media. And um, if, if you want to get in front of this train, then what I think you need to do is, again, look to some of the examples from the campaign about how they used all of these things together. They used Facebook demographics to figure out emails that they were going to send to ask people to download an app to a smartphone. So those are three different silos that they wrapped all together in order to achieve one outcome. So um, in, instead of thinking these thinking of these as separate channels, thinking of, think of them as cogs in one machine that all have to work together and um, leverage the strengths of each particular one to drive to those outcomes. So just in closing, if you can use social targeting to optimize your messaging, monitor trends and activities through the use of models and, and analytics, and use the best of breed tools to execute, I think that's the formula for becoming the Wayne Gretzky of social media. Thank you.